Hey, Mike here. Let's try this again. My card filled up. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about here is this uh, this refrigerator here. Um, if you watch any of my other videos, you'll have a better idea of what we're working with here. Uh, this t t today is specifically about a, uh, a paraffin uh, 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 phase change heat storage mechanism there for the condenser. Um, just briefly go over it, we got a 4.4 cubic foot uh, mini fridge that's been gutted. Uh, a hole's been cut in the top of it and that board uh, um, supports the compressor and the entire uh, condensing unit. And then inside we have <clears throat> A stainless steel pan there. If anybody has ever been in the restaurant industry, you'll recognize that's a two-inch uh, half steam table, table pan. It's got some stainless steel uh, fins soldered to it. A baffle, which uh, dumps some of the cold air down to the bottom, keeps things circulated around. Uh, that pan has uh, uh, a uh, relatively long quarter-inch copper evaporator laying in the bottom of the pan. The pan contains about 10% propylene glycol and uh, the rest is water. It starts to freeze at about 26 Fahrenheit and continues freezing until the whole thing would theoretically turn solid down around the negative 60, negative 70 degrees. Never gets that cold, but um, it allows me to store some cooling uh, capacity in that, uh, in that uh, um, propylene glycol water mix. Uh, it's a non-eutectic um, phase change material. Uh, and that way I can run the fridge, <clears throat> you know, when it calls for cooling and uh, it will, you know, refreeze that thing when the compressor shuts off, the ice will uh, melt and it will uh, continue to cool the fridge for several hours. Um, and in that way it uh, increases the length of my run time, but also vastly increases the length of my off time too. So uh, this thing will hold over for several hours. Uh, up till now it's... Uh, you know, pretty typically in the last few days, it'll run for about an hour, it'll be off for about four or five hours. Um, compressor is a rotary compressor, 120 volt AC. It's about, um, uh, about six horsepower, maybe eight horsepower. Um, <clears throat> the uh, refrigerant is propane, uh, right out of the bottle, barbecue grade, uh, also known as R290 when it's a little bit more refined than this. Um, up until now, last few days, I've been using the uh, static condenser. This video is going to be a little longer. I got a lot of stuff to explain. Uh, it's a static condenser made out of copper. There's some other videos you can watch that explain that. Um, I got this idea a few days. Actually, I got this idea several years ago. I wanted to try this out, and a few days ago, I said, "Well, what the hell? I'm already storing cooling capacity in the fridge in the form of the uh, the non-eutectic phase change material. Um, so I'm pumping out, you know, the heat absorbed by that that uh, ice over the course of the last off cycle." Uh, so four or five hours worth of heat that's absorbed through the box or whatever I put in the box or opening the door. Um, and I have to discharge all that heat, say, within an hour or two. Um, so the idea here was, well, why don't we try to discharge all that heat into another phase change material that can then slowly dissipate that heat over the course of the next several hours until the whole thing is re-solidified and it's ready for another, it's recharged, it's ready for another go. Um, at which point the compressor kicks on and it melts all this uh, this paraffin. Uh, this is uh, essentially Vaseline, it's white petroleum jelly. Um, try going around town and buying uh, you know an eight pound tub of petroleum jelly. People uh, kind of look at you funny. So I uh, ended up just buying the little, little tubs and uh, throwing it in a double boiler and uh, melting it and pouring it in there. Uh, this is a kind of a glass um, vase. I guess it's like a flower vase or something. I bought it at Goodwill for a couple of bucks. Um, drilled a hole in the bottom here for the outlet of the condenser and the inlets right here that's just the discharge from the compressor and it just coils the whole way down you can see that there's 3 16 copper tubing about 50 well it's exactly 50 feet um, there's a whole roll so uh, just kind of sitting in there there's a little bit of a stainless steel support in the bottom there to, to keep it uh, kind of level um, so what that does there is um, when this wax is solid, which it's kind of semi-solid right now, this is not a pure paraffin, um, it's, it's a hodgepodge of, uh, of hydrocarbon chains, um, I, not, I don't know all the details, so don't ask me, um, but uh, it has a melting point of roughly 99 degrees. It's really a melting range, maybe centered around 99 degrees, uh, because it's a mixture of so many different hydrocarbons. If I were to get a more pure paraffin substance, it would have a more uh, uh, sharp melting point, but uh, um, that's not the case here. So uh, it was cheap, it was easy, and it's got a fresh scent to it. Kind of smells like baby powder, especially when it's really warm. You know, it's very effervescent. 
So during the run, uh, this thing uh, uh, melts all this uh, this paraffin in there, and uh, and then we have a thermosiphon, which I've been wanting to build a practical, useful uh, thermosiphon for a while. I've built a few um, that uh, just to kind of demonstrate the principle, but this one actually does something. So we have an air-cooled condenser. Um, I went for the air-cooled one simply because uh, I figured if I can't do it with the air-cooled, I'm static's not not uh, not going to be an option. So uh, this is a completely separate refrigerant loop. It's completely passive on this end, uh, with the exception of the fan. But you know what I, what I mean is there's no pumping action of the propane. Uh, all pumping action that occurs in this line and this line here um, is is passive. It's a bubble pump. So there's a certain amount of liquid propane and of course gaseous propane in there uh, sitting at saturation. <clears throat> And uh, there's another large coil that sits inside of this outer coil here. Uh, it's made out of quarter-inch tubing, which has been recycled from a, another project. Uh, it's far less uh, less length. It's probably only about 20 feet, um, and it's quarter-inch instead of three sixteenths. Um, <clears throat> that coil um, is designed to absorb heat from the melted paraffin, and then to uh, pump any vapor bubbles that are that are produced along with any liquid that gets pumped up with it up into the top of this condenser coil and then uh, liquid that's both been uh, uh, condensed and uh, cooled returns back to the bottom of the coil to pick up more heat and start the whole process over again. Um, the fan obviously helps that process quite a bit. Um, it's going to run continuously for the next you know, day or so to several days depending on how long I decide to mess around with this thing. Um, right now where I have this probe at, it's about 90, uh, 98 degrees. Um, I've seen this thing up to as high as about 111 today, but that's just where the, that probe is. It varies throughout the paraffin there. Um, obviously as the heat is being added at the coil, that's gonna liquefy first. Um, the issue that I think I might run into with paraffin is uh, it has very low uh, electrical conductivity. It's an insulator, so it's probably a thermal insulator too. So that kind of sucks for this application, but um, it's uh, there's there's some some progress here. There's some some good things that are happening. Uh, so anyway, so the thermosiphon seems to be doing its trick, um, doing its job. Um, the thermo hand over the discharge over the top of the uh, the evaporator coil. That is the evaporator for the thermosiphon. Uh, it's noticeably warm. Throw my hand over the return from the condenser of the thermosiphon, and it's quite a bit cooler. So uh, definitely some action going on there. How much liquid and how much bubble action is going on, I don't know. I don't have a sight glass in it. Um, I didn't want to use a glass tube with the vinyl tubing like I've done before um, because uh, those are notoriously leaky, and I've actually had one pop on me uh, because I applied too much heat to the evaporator. Um, right now, saturation's about uh, one... 80, 180 PSI, which corresponds to about 103 degrees. So we're showing 98 there. So I would say probably the average temperature across the whole thing is, uh, is about 103 degrees, because that's what the saturation pressure we're showing. So um, as far as performance goes, it's only still in its first cycle. Um, the fridge was off for several hours, so uh, uh, it had a bit of work to do. So let's show you here a little bit of what's been going on. So um, it's taking samples every 15 seconds. This is showing 2,500 seconds. So every one of these lines represents about two hours. Um, so here's a typical run with the old static condenser that was earlier today uh, around noon. Looks like it ran for about an hour. And uh, then from the last run, it's just off the screen there. It looks like um, maybe about three hours maybe a little more than three hours, uh, that it was off before that. Um, then we have this long off time and the temperature rose a fair amount inside the box. Um, temperature warmed up a little bit and the, you know, the ambient here uh, got a little warm. So um, so it was off while I was doing the changeover of the, uh, the system. And uh, then we can see that when I kicked it back on here. Now, um, this yellow line here, I don't have the discharge superheat on here right now, um, but this yellow line represents the, uh, the subcooling, the, the, uh, the, the temperature after the condenser. And you can see it's very, very, very high right there. Um, see a normal run previously was right there. Now with the static condenser, the, the, uh, 
subcooling is really not that great. Um, but it's a hell of a lot better than what I was seeing in the first half hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour of, uh, of the operation with this thing. Now I had some concerns uh, about the paraffin. Um, I mentioned the thermal conductivity or lack thereof. Um, and also uh, um, as the whole mass of it really starts to heat up, um, I didn't really see how it was gonna subcool to any great extent. And that's exactly what I've, I've found. Um, Subcooling is usually about seven degrees, which is pretty piss poor. Particularly if you're um, condensing up over, you know, a buck forty, buck, buck forty-five. Um, it's pretty hot. It's coming out back pretty, pretty damn hot. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we were definitely pulling the temperature down. Uh, there's a faint gray line there. You can see it, it travels up and then down. You can see previously in the old runs there, it slowly comes up and then back down, up and back down. Um, that's a um, that's the temperature pretty well close to what the thermostat's reading. It's another thermocouple mounted uh, uh, close to it and then clamped very, uh, very pretty firmly up to the bottom of the pan. Um, and it reads uh, several degrees warmer than the uh, temperature in the bottom of the pan. I have another thermocouple down there. So, uh, um, you know, initially I was pulling the temperature down pretty well, um, but the discharge pressures kept going up and up and up and up and up. So saturation on the high side kept going up and up, and the uh, the amount of subcooling that I was getting out of it was uh, was uh, declining, and the the temperature of the the high side liquid going to the cap tube was was rising and rising. Um, <clears throat> As that paraffin melts and the temperature begins to build and build and build, if that thermosiphon can't pull that heat out effectively, um, that temperature is going to continue to climb, the high side pressure is going to continue to climb, uh, it's going to keep pushing more and more refrigerant into the low side, um, and uh, uh, as that discharge pressure goes up as well, there's more work that the compressor has to do, uh, discharge superheat. Um, starts to rise we end up with more and more and more uh, uh, excess work there the compressor just kicked off that was the first run cycle uh, and then that's just that much more heat that needs to be dumped into the uh, into the paraffin and, and, and discarded um, so you know the temperature going to the cap tube the cap tube itself just wrapping my hands around it, it was pretty damn hot um, and although I'm running a uh, heat interchanger where it's wrapped around the suction tube it's uh, uh, it would have been. It was dumping a good bit of heat into that suction line, and uh, eventually, I wasn't too happy with this, the uh, suction temperatures that I was getting. So I dumped a lot more refrigerant in. You see that red line where it really starts to drop, and then the, this light blue line plummets not long after. Um, that uh, that red one there is the uh, evaporator temperature directly after the evaporator. So I quickly uh, dumped enough refrigerant in there that it was able to. Uh, satisfy the, uh, the needs of the evaporator and uh, bring it down to saturation. Um, the blue one there is after that heat interchanger I talked about. So it was dumping all that heat from the capillary tube into the suction line. And uh, it's a few degrees warmer than, uh, than saturation, but uh, something didn't quite add up there. Um, uh, it seemed like there should have been a lot, a lot more temperature difference between the red line and the blue line. Um, but what I found over time was uh, that uh, uh, that subcooling temperature kept continued to rise, and um, although initially we saw a sudden drop in uh, the temperature of the pan, I mean over the course of 20 minutes or half an hour, uh, it really started to flatten out once I dumped that extra refrigerant in there. Um, I was getting very high discharge, uh, high side pressures up over 300 pounds, 315 pounds, which corresponds to about 146, uh, and um, with that high discharge pressure, it was pushing a lot more refrigerant to the low side, which was raising the suction pressure as well. And uh, that suction pressure was up over, I think it was about 35, 36 pounds, which is like 14, 13, 14, 15 degrees. Um, when I'm trying to bring that pan temperature down, you know, very close to the evaporator, um, when I'm trying to bring that thing down to, yeah, right now it just shut off and it's showing me about two, um, two degrees. Um, Typically, I've been seeing about maybe like five, six, seven degrees, just a few minutes after it shuts off, once things kind of equalize. Um, but if I'm trying to bring it down to those low temperatures, and uh, you know, say the pan temperature is showing me it's 16 degrees, 17 degrees, and my evaporator temperature is only about 14, it ain't moving any heat. You don't have enough 
temperature difference to actually absorb any heat into the evaporator. Um, so uh, although I was running close to saturation, um, I realized very quickly that I had this thing overcharged. Um, so the first thing that I did was uh, vein. And uh, right away, I saw the suction temperature rise. The uh, suction pressure dropped. So uh, saturation at that pressure was a much lower temperature. So that refrigerant was, was uh, evaporating and boiling away at a lower temperature. And that gave me my um, enough temperature difference between the evaporator coil and the glycol of water that I'm trying to freeze to actually start moving some heat again. Um, so once I did that, um, low side pressure dropped, high side pressure dropped. So um, probably overall flow rate decreased a bit, but uh, because the head pressure came down so much, current draw on the compressor declined significantly. And um, dis as I said, discharge pressure declined, so uh, the compressor wasn't doing as much work. Uh, wasn't running, running as hot, discharge superheat dropped significantly, and immediately I started to notice that uh, the uh, the temperature of the paraffin started to actually uh, stop, slowly stop, and uh, the rise of it slowly stop, and then start to decline. And the thermosiphon was actually starting to keep up with it um, and re-solidify it, uh, at least bring it down to a slightly lower temperature. Um, so, you know, we have this plateau here after the initial drop in temperature of the pan. And then um, once after I vented it, we can see a slow decline again. Now, I was running uh, uh, higher superheats than I would like. Um, so there's a few things that I would have to change on this system, particularly the capillary tube, um, to make it run uh, uh, pro pro perhaps a little bit more efficiently. Um, but before I would even mess with the capillary tube, I would look into a subcooling coil. Um, after the paraffin tank. I don't know if I'm actually going to pursue this thing any uh, much further. Um, I want to let this thing run a few few cycles. Um, I might even let it run a few days uh, because, you know, I spent a pile on Vaseline. <laughs> I can't return it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, it's, it's my first application of a thermosiphon that, uh, that actually works. Um, it has a purpose, and uh, and the paraffin tank. That's something I've always wanted to see, and uh, just had to do it myself. So, uh, you know, I might as well just uh, play with it a little bit. And uh, you know, if it's something that's I think I can make practical, and there's a significant advantage to it, um, I might pursue it further. But uh, you know, at this point, I'm just going to uh, just play with it a little bit. You see, uh, see, it's getting pretty milky there. Um, it was, uh, it was pretty thin there for a while. You can see all the goopy stuff there on top. That's just where I was probing around, seeing where it was solid and where it was liquid. So, uh, anyway, got about 94 degrees on that, and uh, I expect this thing to hold over for uh, two plus hours, maybe as long as four. So, for the rest of the evening, I'm going to kind of keep it, keep an eye on that temperature. Uh, on the wax and see how low uh, low it gets. Now, the lower the temperature gets on that wax, the less activity I'm going to get in the thermosiphon because there's less of a temperature difference between the air being blown across that condensing coil and uh, and you know the evaporator temperature at the bottom of the thermosiphon. Um, so, uh, just like anything, anything cooling down, is it uh, it will never actually get to uh, you know to room temperature. It'll get closer and closer and closer, but at a slower and slower rate. Um, there is obviously uh, power being consumed there by the fan because it's going to run continuously. It's not tied into the thermostat. Um, you know, eventually I would, uh, a person could put a controller or something like that on there. So uh, with a separate thermostat, I suppose, on the wax. But uh, I'm not interested in doing that at this point because uh, I want to go static. I want to go with a static condenser. So uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, that was a brief overview, as brief as I could make it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to keep an eye on it. There's probably going to be at least one more video on this thing here tomorrow or in the next few days. Um, but, uh, yeah, so <laughs> thanks for watching. <laughs>